Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray. And we've got a real treat today. I'm going to be interviewing Chris Worth, who's an amazing guy. He's the founder and president of No Quit Living. Uh, and they, their organization motivates and inspires their clients to never give up on themselves or their goals. He's the host of the No Quit Living podcast, which has been rated as a top 50 podcast on iTunes. He's a sought-after keynote speaker. He's coached AAU high school and college basketball. He lives in Greenwich, Connecticut with his three children, Zach, Emily, and Mason. They enjoy spending time playing sports, traveling, reading, and working out. And he's the author of the newly released book, the Positivity Tribe, where he takes you on a journey that demonstrates how life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. So having said all that, welcome, Chris. I appreciate that. I'm going to have to record that and I'm going to have to use that introduction. <laughs> well, it, uh, I've, I'm pleased to read it because there's some exciting things that you're doing and and uh, I appreciate you being with me today. And as, as we always do, Chris, I want to start out to, just by asking you how, how your faith and your understanding of God's love and grace has impacted your life and your uh, friendships and uh, just everybody in all the different relationships that you have. I think uh, for me, faith is, is something that I learned. I think it was taught to me uh, when I was a child with, through my parents and going to church and going to CCD. And then I think as you become an adult, you develop your own, I guess, faith-based principles and you see how, how it ha impacts your life. And for me, so many amazing things have happened. And like you said in the introduction, it's not to me, but it's for me. I have some amazing relationships. I have some amazing friendships. And for me, the faith perspective is, is something that's really important because I think it's something important in today's day and age that a lot of people, I think, miss the boat on. And, and you have people that are, I guess, over the top religious and people that are completely against it. And I think where we need to fall is somewhere in the middle is, is understanding people's differences. And I think for me, having that faith, a faith base has really been important through all different parts of my life, both for business, professional, but also personal. And I think it's the times you're challenged when, when you have to really rely on your faith. And I think that's a lot of times when unfortunately people let go of faith when they need it the most. Yeah. Well said that that does seem to be um, the way it happens and letting go uh, when they need it the most uh, is, uh, really ties in with no quit living. Tell us how you came up with the, with that name, that phrase and, and uh, what you're doing with it. Yeah, I appreciate that. So it's pretty simple. Uh, story. I love quotes. And I think to this day, I still subscribe to three or four quotes of the day. And it was many years ago, the quote came across my desk by Norman Vincent Peale. It's always too early to quit. And ultimately, I got the license plate, no quit, which I still have had now on, I think, four or five different vehicles. And um, when I launched the No Quit Living Company, which is a speaking, training, coaching company, a few years ago, what I realized is it doesn't matter if you're young, old, into sports, not in sports, an entrepreneur or, or somebody who's a typical employee, everybody has had those times in their life where they've been challenged, where they've been knocked down. And I didn't understand it at the time that no quit theme would really resonate with so many different people because it's not about the top. It's not about being the best. It's about what, what took to get there. It's about the challenges, the struggles. And for me, having been able to interview some unbelievably successful people from all walks of life. What I absolutely love the most is having those, those people share their no quit story or their stories, plural, because the reality is we all get knocked down, some of us more, more than others. But the question is, do we get back up stronger? Do we get back up a better version of ourselves? And do we get back up more intelligent version of ourselves? And that's the, and that's the, the unknown, because the reality is, is you, myself, we've all gotten knocked down multiple times. And we're probably going to continue to get knocked down moving forward. It's, it's always how you respond and react to that. Great. You've got some examples of people that uh, you've not just spoken to at one time, but you've been able to work with and coach and help uh, not quit or when they're tempted to, to get back up and keep on going. Yeah, I think, uh, I think in the sports world, as well as the, the sales world, for me, I do a lot in the real estate coaching world and speaking in that field, but also work with some college sports teams. And I think it's continually discussing those, those times when those players or their salespeople want to give up when they don't get that first sale or 
they don't win the game or they have, you know, a terrible loss or a couple really bad three or four or five games. And for me, it's, it's understanding the mental perspective of how are you going to handle this? Are you going to allow it to, to stop you? Are you allow, are you going to allow it to make you quit? Or are you going to learn from it and become better? And that's something that I talk about a lot with my clients is the mental performance perspective of that positive mental advantage, what we call the PMI and really focusing on making the best out of that situation and really learning from it. And again, back to what you had said, early in introduction is it didn't happen to me. It happened for me. And how are we going to learn as a team? How are we going to learn as a salesperson? How am I going to be better for the next opportunity? And to me, that's the one thing I love about sports and business, especially in sales is typically you always get a next opportunity. Obviously it's, it's not going to be the exact same. And sometimes it's different in sports, but typically you get the next opportunity. So in basketball, it's, you know, you have a tough loss, you know, typically you have another game. Obviously, if it's the finals or something, that's a different story. And then in sales, it's the same thing. Is is typically, if you if you don't get that customer or if you lose that sale, there's another opportunity down the road. And it's being mentally tough to handle it the best way moving forward. Do you have some specific principles, some steps to take, some different things that go along with it? Yeah, th- th- there's nothing specific in the sense of what we do with each and every every client because it, it is really different. One of the things we we focus on is we do a lot of visualization, and we do that in two forms. One is actually putting things down on paper, putting things up on board. So whether that's in locker rooms, whether that's in sales teams, and then the other thing which I have mine in front of me is is a journal and and notebook, notepad. People call it different things, but it's the visualization perspective of of seeing it and then also writing it down. And then we're, we're firm believers in goals and affirmations. And I think that's something that people, I think, miss the boat on quite often is the importance of having goals, but also the importance of affirming them to you in the sense of being in a positive present tense. I'm going to compete today. I'm going to give my best effort this afternoon. Tomorrow, I'm mentally prepared for this sales opportunity. I've prepared myself for this meeting. I've prepared myself for all the potential objections and what the client's needs or objectives are. And I think when you go through those, those things, you put yourself in the best opportunity in the best frame of light to be successful in whatever endeavor that is. Yeah, that's great. I've, uh, I started keeping a journal decades ago and I still do. And I, uh, uh, I have a loose leaf folder with me that I, uh, take things that I see or write down or hear or things that come to my mind. And, uh, I'll keep them in that folder and, you know, switch them in and out with new things from time to time. But there's some things that I've got there that have been there for several years that uh, just remind me of times when I, uh, uh, I couldn't for the life of me figure out how we were going to make it and this business or that business or this particular project or whatever, and, or financially or relationally or whatever. And then to, to see how, uh, uh, in, in my view, to see how God has uh, come through and taken things that seemed not good at all, and he's worked them out for the good. And uh, I need those reminders so I can go back and think about them, and uh, <laughs> it keeps me going for the next time. No, it's, I think it's so important. And, and unfortunately, with, with technology where it is today, we have that what I call that shiny object syndrome, where it's, if it doesn't bang or beep or vibrate, you kind of get, this, you know, forget about it. But that's what I love about an actual journal because you can actually put it down, whether it's a quote, a memory, an idea, a concept, something to follow up on. And, you know, statistics have proven, and obviously you know this because you, you do have journals, is, is what you don't write down, ultimately you forget. And, you know, it's a challenge. People say, oh, well, I'll put it on my phone and I'll do this. And, and you're thinking about putting it in your phone. And then all of a sudden you, you get a vibration or a text or a, you know, DM and all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's an hour later and you're like, what was it? Was, there's something I had to do. So that's why I always work on that with my clients. And I actually provide a bunch of journals and note, notebooks for my clients because I think it's super important to, to have that place. And especially with sports is, and in sales is go back to that quote unquote Bible of, you know, what's worked, you know, what, what's worked in the past and what will hopefully work in the future. Yeah, that's great. I, I learned those principles in business uh, quite a while ago, but it, I, I was also, I had a 24 year career in the army reserves. I was a, a bandmaster at two different units and um, you know, we would meet one, e- we, one weekend a month and then for two weeks in the summer and uh, every morning after we'd have our initial formation, I'd, I'd get the leaders together 
and I'd talk through what I wanted to accomplish during the day and, and all of that. And uh, occasionally there'd be somebody new transfer in. And when I'd go through my morning uh, session and talking with them, which wasn't very long, 15, 20 minutes, generally that new person wouldn't write anything down. Uh, but those who'd been with me for a while would. And so then, you know, I would just kind of uh, casually drop in on them and watch what they were doing that day. And uh, I would invariably have the opportunity to say, uh, well, how are you coming with this? And, oh, man, I forgot about that. You did say that this morning, didn't you? And I said, yeah, you know, you might try tomorrow uh, bringing a notebook <laughs> and writing these things down. I, I probably wasn't as... Uh, encouraging as I could be today, I, I generally back in those days would say, you know, your next promotion depends on it. So you better bring that. <laughs> but in reality, our next promotion or our next victory or next sale or next win or whatever does, does boil down to taking care of business. hundred percent. That's a great story. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, in sports, there's always another game. Unfortunately, this year, uh, there weren't. And here in, in Lawrence, where I live with uh, KU basketball, you know, we were ranked number one in the country. Uh, we were uh, getting ready to play our first game in the, in the Big 12 tournament, uh, <clears throat> thinking that we had a, certainly as good a chance as anybody to uh, uh, win it all. We had a couple of All-Americans, and, and all of a sudden, there wasn't another game. So how do you help people who are in a situation like that? You know, that's, that's a great analogy. And ironically, as, as you know, I'm, I'm fond with um, and close with a couple KU coaches. And I actually got that text message from one of the assistant coaches who let me know when it happened that uh, the Big 12 tournament was off. And to your point, they were about to play. Um, and in, in that regard, it's, it's what can you control? And we go back to the term I, I know you've heard, which is controlling the controllables. And at that point, and, and it happened to a bunch of our clients is, is that NCAA tournament got eliminated. A bunch of our clients, you know, spring sports and things this, this year got completely eliminated, college baseball teams. And going back to controlling the controllables is, is what can you can control? And the reality is there are only a few things you can control. Buzz Williams, the head coach of uh, yeah, Texas, I forget where he is now. Um, um, he used to be the coach at um, – bunch of places but he had a fantastic podcast that he that i listened to him on and he, and he said that exact same thing as he said we were literally in the locker room with our team and we found out that season was over and he said at that point as you go into that mode of obviously you have those emotions of being disappointed upset frustrated as as not only i'm sure many players on the ku team and staff but also other other schools and it's controlling the controllables and and what can i control right now moving forward and a lot of times, again, going back to, to that whiteboard into the, into the notebook and putting things down is, is focusing on your energy and your attention, what you have control over. And at the time, the Big 12 tournament obviously was canceled first. It wasn't for a few days later where the NCAA tournament was canceled. And at that exact moment, it's what can I can control moving forward? I can't control the Big 12 tournament. It's been canceled. What I can control is how our team is going to respond and react to the potential upcoming NCAA tournament. Are we going to come to practice tomorrow prepared? Are we going to make sure we're safe and clean and washing our hands and taking care of that? And I think even without this, this pandemic we have right now, it, it's a lesson that I think we all need to use more is, is controlling the controllables. And it doesn't mean in any way, shape or form that you don't have emotion towards things that don't go your way or things that unfortunately turn out. And as you said, you know, being ranked the number one team in the country, you know, biased myself a little bit but I think that that KU had the the biggest chance to win the national championship this year and unfortunately there will never be a champion for this year and it's always going to be the unknown and another good friend of mine is a grad from Dayton University and they were ranked number three at the time and you know they their claim is that you know they could have potentially won this year so I think the fun perspective is is nobody will ever know per se but moving forward is, is how do we control this? And the one thing that's, that's difficult is for those seniors that, that lost their opportunity is, is the next quote unquote game is going to them and saying, Hey, what's, what's your next game? And it might not be on a, on a physical basketball court. Maybe instead it's at grad school. Maybe it's at your first job. Maybe it's at the entrepreneurial bug, but typically, you know, there's another opportunity down the road. It might not look and feel exactly the same way, 
but there are other opportunities and, and sometimes you have to look a little bit harder to find them. Yeah, you do. I, uh, I remain friends with Ted Owens, which was who was basketball coach at KU for 19 years, and and uh, gosh, Ted's I think he's 88. He just had a birthday, um, and this wasn't original with him, but uh, uh, when he was coaching at KU, and I was friends with him, and and we uh, hung out in different settings. Uh, he, he said, as other coaches have too, but uh, he, he said it. You know, it's it's going to take. 10, 15 years after these guys graduate before I see what, until I can see what they've done in their life before I can really know, uh, you know, what they're made of and uh, whether they uh, had uh, real success. I'm not sure those are the right terms that he used, but uh, uh, it's not, you know, obviously their success on the court, on the field, but uh, then how you uh, translate that or transfer that into what you do with your life. Uh, uh, that's where the difference really comes. Yeah, I think that's that's a really, really important key. And and for me, working with and having coached a bunch of high school and college athletes, it's always it's always really special to see them two, five, ten years down the road and what they're doing, the type of men or woman they become, and and the different things they're doing. Because to your point, at the time, it's the number one thing. It's their most important thing. They've worked, you know, most of their teenage years and and early adult years for this sport and although it's important at the time the reality is they will be non-college athletes for a significantly longer time than they will be college athletes and it's always fun to see to see how how kids turn out like you said five ten yeah so your three kids are they into sports what do they do yeah they're all uh i got two boys and a girl they're all into uh sports they do a bunch of things skiing sailing uh, they all play soccer um baseball lacrosse they uh they do a, a bunch of it and i think for me um now you know you hear about kids you know specializing they tell parents you know make sure you specialize at the age of you know five and then your kid you know does this one thing forever I, i'm trying to take the other the other approach with uh with my ex in the sense of allowing the kids to really enjoy a lot of different things and figure out what they need need to do versus want to do versus you know have to do down the road is you know and and i think at the young age, it's trying to just um, expose them to a bunch of different things. Now you played both tennis and basketball, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Did you coach both? I did. I did um, not collegially, uh, but I, I coached college uh, basketball, high school and AAU. And then I coached tennis growing up in, in summer leagues and, and summer camps. So with three kids that active in sports, how do you, uh, how do you make it to all of their games? How do you get them to all their games? that's that's uh their their uh their mother does a, a bunch of that but uh, that's the challenge and, and i think with with the nuttiness of what's going on it's it almost like they have a game or a practice every night of the week and then during the summer it's almost like non-stop so that's that's a that's a challenge within itself and i think i need a schedule and then another backup schedule and calendar just to uh keep it straight yeah yeah, we do. So have most of their uh, activities been stopped with the with the virus? Yeah, most almost every single thing has been stopped. A couple of things are hopefully mm -hmm. opening up in the fall. Uh, but I, I think where we are in, in Connecticut, we're literally on the border of New York. New York's one of the toughest states just because it's it's the hub of, of travel and people coming in and out and things. So I I'm optimistic, but um, I'm not holding my breath as far as uh, what's going to come about because I know safety is first and foremost. But I just you feel bad for first, you know, those kids that are just losing on opportunities, and I think it's uh, it's tough. But hopefully, we can all get through this together. So, did you uh, do some teaching at home? I, I'm assuming the schools were canceled where you all you are. Did you uh, teach the kids and they do some online stuff at home? Yeah, they did uh, all online stuff. Uh, the, their school has has a pretty good um, criteria of what they do and how they do it, and they all have tablets and different things. It's to me, it's it's crazy um, just to grasp it because I'm a visual learner. I'm an in person learner, so this you know technology on a screen, and and I just hope that we can get back to some type of normalcy because I think not that I'm a professional in any way, shape, or form, but I think kids in general learn way better in person than they do watching something on a tablet or on a laptop. Yeah, I agree. My uh, 
wife and my wife's a retired teacher and my daughter teaches special ed and uh, you know they uh, our daughter and her son who's 14 live with us and uh, you know we've all three taken turns helping him uh, uh, with both with online stuff and keeping him busy and going out and hiking and walking and doing as much as we can but uh, not everybody's able to do that in their family situation so I, I feel for those who are in that uh, in that situation but um, we're not going to quit because th this isn't going to last. <laughs> no, definitely won't. We we will get through this 100%. Chris, our time is almost up, but we're going to do another uh, uh, session here that our, our listeners and watchers will see uh, and hear a week later. And in that next one, uh, I'd like to talk more about uh, your new book uh, that's going to uh, come out in this August. But so in the meantime, tell people how they can connect with you. Appreciate that. So I love connecting and meeting new people. I always give my personal email address, which is chris at noquitliving.com. And then our website is no quit living and um, the podcast, you can find it anywhere where podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts and we're pretty active on social media as well. So those are the easiest ways. And we really try to respond because we love connecting with, with new people and uh, making new opportunities to uh, have relationships. Great. Well, and I appreciate you connecting with me through a mutual friend. And um, I want to thank everybody for watching and listening today. And we'll be back with another interview next week uh, with Chris Worth. So thank you, Chris. And thanks, everybody, for watching. I appreciate it. See you next time.